How are you? I'm well, thank you. And you? I'm fine, thank you. Robert, just to clarify, I've read, I've read your books. So just for a clarification, uh, do you uh, post as that you are a teacher or a speaker of life? Well, I, so that I, can. I would never call myself a teacher because I don't really have anything to teach. What I, okay. what I, what I experience is that I had a kind of a breakthrough a long time ago that gave me a point of view that seems unusual. But I'm not the only okay. one who has it. it. I'm not the only one who has it. But when I say unusual, I mean it's not that common. And since that happened, when people ask me questions, the answers just arise. I'm not, I don't have any sense that the answer is coming from Robert. If you ask me a question, I just speak. I, I, I don't feel that I'm constructing any answer. And that's why I don't, don't have anything to teach. I mean, unless there's a question, there's no, there's no activity. Uh, what was the uh, a shift which happened before and after? which makes you what you are now, a bit different from us. What, I, I, I didn't follow that, you're asking. The shift, the shift, the shift. Yeah, well, I, I hear people call that a shift. I, I don't really like that term because this is here right now. It's not that you shift somewhere else. It's here right now, but we've been trained from childhood not to notice it because the culture doesn't want us to notice it. It wants us to be doers and to be good citizens and follow the yellow brick road and get your life insurance and all the rest of it. They don't want you to sit there and say, I'm not doing this, but that's a fact. Nobody's really doing anything. I mean, we have doings, but they don't arise from any center there. It's the entire the entire flow of, of life is the doer, not the individual human, as I see it. But this was not the case before a certain event happened in your life. That's true. Uh, That's true. I noticed, I, but you see, it wasn't a shift. It was just something I noticed it, within my ordinary life. It's not like lightning hit me and I, there was this great transformation or something. I was just sitting there in my pickup truck looking out at the landscape in a very beautiful place. I was parked on the edge of the Rio Grande Gorge, which is a beautiful place in New Mexico. And I'd been there many times, it was my home. And I'm just sitting there, you see, and looking out into the distance. And then it was like a voice spoke to me, but it wasn't a voice, but it was like a voice in my mind. And I thought, I'm not doing this. I'm not. I didn't make that gorge and I didn't make Robert. It's all, it's all happening together. It's all one, it's all one gesture. And the sense of myself that I've been trained to have, you have your ID card and you're responsible and you have to feel shame when you do the wrong thing and all of this kind of stuff. That was an overlay. It was like a grid that had been put on life. And that just dropped away for a moment. And I just saw, saw things in a different way. I saw myself as a happening, not as a doer. Yes? So can, can, I, can I say that uh, after that event, uh, the eyeness in you dropped something, the sense of doership? Yeah, but it, 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 took, it took several years. It was very painful. Um, things that I had relied on doing because I was motivated to do them, a lot of the motivation left. And um, I found myself really struggling because I had a career and I kept on doing it, but it felt more and more not connected to what I was really feeling. And there was a lot of suffering, psychological suffering involved, I would say for several years until I could somehow find out how to be an ordinary human again. Uh, it's hard so, to explain. 
Yeah. So those num after the number of years, then did that eye collapse totally? Now, as of now, the eyeness of doing things like which we have. Well, it's hard to know. It's hard for me to know what you mean by eyeness. I certainly have a sense of being a, a, a person. I mean, here I am. I wake up in the morning and I have my point of view. I have my home, not not someone else's house. I've got donkeys that I own. I own them and I take care of them. But yes, I do not have a sense of some kind of firm myself that continues through time. I don't really have that sense. And but this happened after a couple of years, as you were telling us. Maybe about six or seven years until the whole thing really gelled so that I could continue living in an ordinary way and still honor this understanding or this point of view. It, it's, it was a period of adjustment or of, and during that time, I, I had never been that much of a spiritual seeker before this happened. I mean, I was familiar with the same stuff that other my friends read, but I, I didn't go to India, no project to be enlightened, none of that. I wasn't on that track. But after this happened, I read a number of accounts of other people's awakenings and other, other books to try to understand what had happened to me. That's when I hit on UG Krishnamurti. That was he was very his writing was very helpful to me, because apparently what happened to him was similar to my experience, not the same, but in the in the ballpark. And um, I looked into a lot of it for a few years. I read on, I read on the science of the nervous system and read some spiritual books. Um, and now I don't anymore. I don't really have any interest in that. I so think... I gather that, yeah, please, yeah, please. Go, no, please, please go ahead. Uh, that uh, prior to the event happening, the awakening, you were not a seeker as such, and you could not label that you did, you did a certain thing and you got the awakening. That couldn't be said, a, a cause-effect relationship. Oh, well, it's not that simple. Um, I, I was aware of the work of George Gurdjieff, and had read um, his books, and that influenced me. That influenced me. Shut off my phone here. Okay, sorry. Um, so I'm talking about George Gurji. I, yeah, I was aware of this system that Gurji taught about the three centers of the body and trying to get those three centers into alignment. And I'd worked with that a little, but I don't think that accounts for the experience I had. I don't think it was important. I know it's very tempting to try to say this, you, he, he followed this method for a while and look what happened, he, he awakened. But I don't, I, I can't say that's what happened. You said uh, from the initial time of awakening till for about six to seven years, there was a time of adjustment. Yeah. Where there was suffering, where there was suffering. Had been total like now. Has the suffering gone from your life? Um, well, there's still physical suffering. I mean, I wake up in the morning. I broke my back uh, a couple of years ago, and it still hurts when I get out of bed in the morning. Um, I, I woke with a headache today. That seems to have passed. So there's that kind of suffering is there, and sometimes I feel a tremendous sadness um, when I see the way that we humans are living in general. Um, if I contemplate it, I can start to cry, actually. I don't know if you call that suffering or not. Empathy, a sort of empathy. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's empathy. And empathy, empathy is suffering. Empathy is you're standing in someone else's shoes, not just pretending that you're standing in their shoes. You actually feel what it would be like. So is that suffering? I guess. But the psychological suffering has gone, which was there prior to the awakening as well, the, Robert as a human being. The kind of suffering that I see a lot of people 
in, are affected by, I don't have that suffering. Uh, for example, a lot of people are really worried about dying. They don't want to die. They're afraid to die. They don't want myself to come to an end. Or what if I go to hell? All these, that's a kind of suffering that doesn't touch me at all. If I if, And Robert, even you had it prior to the awakening, the suffering. Even I had the same type of human suffering before the awakening happened. Of course, we're all just human here. We, we, we suffer, we're animals. And animals suffer. And we have large brains that can not just, a lot of the lower animals, I call them lower, I should, that's not right. On some, on some other branches of the tree, there are animals that have big brains but there's not that much evidence that they think and have ideas. The brain is used to navigate and to collect food and mate and all this. We have, seem to have a little extra brain power that can be used to try to figure out our circumstances. And that really seems to uh, mess a lot of people up. So can I ask you, Robert, that now, let's say that uh, on an average, say 99%, 99.99% of the human population lives like what I am doing or what Robert was doing prior to the awakening in the realm of suffering because of this human brain due to the destined evolutionary pathway. We have uh, sort, of, sort of misutilized it. That is why you say that empathy of, suffer, of looking at the humans and suffering, a uh, type of uh, sadness comes to you. Yes. Which implies that, uh, you know, the human life is not the correct way of life. Can I say that... Uh, people like you who have had the awakening or certain people use different terminologies, enlightenment, shift, et cetera, et cetera. You have transcended that human realm of suffering into another realm of existence. Inside the body, inside the same brain, something has shifted for the software, the awareness where you have transcended that human level. It, it's, it's sort of metaphorical. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far, really. I, I think I think it's just a slightly different point of view that I have. And I think other people have it too. I meet them. There, it's yeah, just, but it is a very minuscule part of the population. It's I think 0. 0.0001%. Well, and what we are looking... I'm sorry, continue. Now what we are looking for, like especially people like me who, are, who call ourselves as seekers in spirituality for years together, we have tried different methods, etc. And we, we are looking at as an, as an inspiration, people like you who with methods or without methods have reached that maybe a very small shift, but like uh, uh, what, uh, you know, the guy who went on to the moon said, a small step for me, but a giant leap for mankind. So you are probably one of the uh, precursors or predecessors of the human evolution if it goes on the right path, that others human can have the slight shift and go away from suffering, which appears to be the major part of our human life because with so much of plentiness in the earth now, there is no dearth of food or money or any material things which we had earlier centuries. But even now human beings are suffering with all these things. So we are looking at you to some sort of guidance that we can follow to achieve the state that you are in. But even if it is minuscule, it, it matters a lot to us. But ultimately at the end of the day, I want to be free of suffering. Yeah, I, well, I understand that, uh, Ilango. The thing is that there have been these teachers and gurus for many centuries, for thousands of years, really. I mean, we know we, go, we can go back 3,000 years and see all this talk. And if that was going to work, it should have worked by now. But it doesn't work. Listening to all that doesn't seem to get through to anyone. What I see the, the listeners to these gurus, to me, they don't seem awake, they seem hypnotized. They, seem, they, they imagine that someone like me really knows everything and can just explain it all and then you'll be enlightened too. And it doesn't work that way. It's not something that can be explained, it's an experience. It's just an experience. It's, you, you might have it in the next second to just notice that you are not creating this reality. It's, it, it's, you're part of it. You see, this can't be put into words adequately. 
I don't feel that I'm answering your question. I feel that your question is being answered, but not by Robert. These words are just coming. I don't know where they come from. If I look, I can't find where, where are they coming from? They're just out my mouth. We've been trained to say, I said it, I spoke. These are my ideas, see, but I don't feel that way. And that's- Robert is just instrument. Not even an instrument. I don't know, see, I don't know. I don't know what we are, really. So uh, can we say that, you know, this body mind is mysterious and it is part of a cosmic software, a program is happening and things are happening by themselves in terms of computers. Yeah, well, I, I would caution you against using computers as, as the metaphor. You see, this, this happens in every, in every um, epoch, epoch of the industrialization. Whatever the, whatever the technology is at that time is used as the metaphor for how the brain works or how the, what the, like in Freud's day, hydraulics were the big thing, steam engines and all this, hydraulics. So his theory of the human mind was hydraulic. There's pressures building up over here and then this releases the pressure and then pressure builds up again. It was all hydraulic. I don't think the human brain is a computer. I don't think it works like a computer. I think it works in a very different way as I understand this. Um, I mentioned David Eagleman before, I've been picking up on his stuff lately. He doesn't think the brain works like a computer either. Um, he, he imagines it as an organic organ that's constantly um, reshaping itself second by second. And uh, computers don't work that way. So, you know, I, I, I really understand the source of your questions. I do. I understand that you have this yearning. I do get that from you because we've spoken before and I've read your comments and see that you are interested in some other people who speak about these things. And there's this feeling, if I could only just get this, this one thing, see, then I would be relieved. But the, this is so hard to put into words. You are that right now. It's just not noticed. It goes unnoticed because something else is more attractive. The idea of becoming is more attractive than the idea of just being what you are. For all of us, we, I mean, I, I remember years ago when I was starting my photography career, all I wanted to do was be a famous photographer. If I had known then what I know now, I would have been so happy to just have a camera and be a photographer. A young man with a beautiful, strong body and a camera and walking around in the world, beautiful. What more could you really ask for? And so at the time, if someone had said, are you satisfied, Robert? I would say, no, I'm not. I want a big show over here. I want my stuff published. I want, and you see, this would all be depressing. It would all be weighing heavily on the actual enjoyment of life, which is not that you become famous, but that you have a camera at all and can walk around in the world using it and seeing things. Now that I'm retired and I don't care about my photography career, I let that go long ago. When I go out with a camera, it's a real joy, much better than it ever was when I was really trying to make something happen. So there, that, I think that's a fair metaphor. The way you are now is beautiful. You will never be this young again. You will never have this opportunity that you have right now. It, it, they, it doesn't keep coming up, it's, it's now or never. And I think when we grasp that deeply, that may, that may do it. Not that Robert can explain anything to you, I can't. I don't, I don't know anything that you don't know. I don't. 
Robert, uh, you were telling that you feel a sadness looking at human beings, the way they live. Yes, it's horrible. So what would you like the human beings to change? They can't. This is it. Nothing. But nothing. you feel sad about it, right? Oh, that's right. I'm, I, we're animals and we're violent animals. We are violent animals. That's why there's always wars everywhere, because we're violent. When we see other animals fighting, we understand they're violent. They can't change. So but what is the sadness you have? The sadness is that I'm not violent anymore, but I have been. And I wish that we weren't the way we are, I guess. You know, it's, it's just sad for me to see how much suffering, bombs falling on babies. Come on, why? It's terrible. You see, and the so-called the so-called enlightened person isn't supposed to feel any of that. They just say, oh, well, that's the way it is, you know. Well, I understand that. That's the way it is, but that I don't feel good about it. Why should I? Robert, you've written these beautiful books. I mean, is there a purpose behind it to educate the human beings? The books. I wrote two books. I guess you've read yeah. both of them. Yeah. Here's, here's what happened, Yolongo. Years ago, my friend Robert Hall, who's now deceased, is a well-known Buddhist teacher, and he and I used to get together weekly to discuss various matters. And one day he said to me, you know, you are a teacher of non-duality. You really should be doing that, not just sitting here talking to me. And I let that sink in for a couple of years. And um, I started to feel he's right. This is a bit selfish. I have something to share. I have a point of view that people seem to want to know about. I'm going to do that. So I started talking about it. And it didn't go well. Um, people came to see me like a, a kind of guru. And um, I found that I was talking a lot of bullshit. I wasn't lying, but I was just using other, other people's ideas and words because I couldn't really penetrate into my own experience and express it. So that first book, The 10,000 Things was so I stopped doing the, the guru bit and went back to just being myself. And then John Troy got me on Facebook. He interviewed me and got me on Facebook. And once I was on Facebook, I entered into these conversations for a couple of years. And there was just so much bullshit. I mean, I could hardly stand it. And then um, I found myself writing a book, which I, I had, well, I've, I've left something out a long ago. The important point is that after trying to be a guru for a year, which didn't work, and listening to all this bullshit on Facebook, I decided I have to just be completely honest. If I'm going to speak about these things, I've got to be honest. I have to, I, I, I won't lie. I won't, I won't make things up. I won't leave things out. And that's how that book came to be. And apparently it worked because I get letters almost every day from people who say this book changed my life. Well, that wasn't the intention. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. I didn't say I'm going to write this book that will change people's lives. I just wanted to express yeah. myself honestly. What was the difference as a speaker you had made as made some mistakes which you corrected as a writer? That, that's what I gather from what you're talking to me. That's right. That, that's what was that mistake which you corrected? It's an attitude that that needed correction. The attitude that I came that when I started when when Robert Hall told me you have this obligation, I took it personally. In a, in a bad way and thought, oh, well, now I have to perform. You know, I have to, people will come to me and they'll ask me questions and I'll explain everything. Uh, so 
now what I, the way I look at that now is that that was really foolish because I don't have that to give. What I have to give is what I'm doing now, which is just speaking as honestly as I can about my experience. I'm not saying, oh, I feel, feel embarrassed that all that happened or whatever. It's not like that. It's just right now we're speaking and whatever comes to my out of my mouth comes out of my mouth. I'm there. Okay, you asked a question before. What's the difference between between me and just like a seeker? I'm not sitting there judging myself at all. That's gone away entirely. Entirely. I don't judge myself. I don't say, oh, you did a bad thing, or isn't this thing you did wonderful, Robert? What a great guy you are. There's none of that. None of it. I'm not proud and I'm not ashamed. I just am. As the separation ceased, the doership that you are doing. Yes. There's no sense of that. No sense. And are you, are you always, most of the time, uh, in a state of... Uh, uh, in a state of unknown joy. There is no reason for you to be happy, but you're happy. Well, I am pretty happy. And compared to the shift earlier, compared to the earlier human life. Well, I, I, yeah, I, was, I wasn't un, exactly unhappy when I was younger, but there was a lot of stress and worries and the, the need for self-improvement. And I don't have that. If, I, if I'm cooking, I cook every night. I'm the, I'm the main chef around here. And um, when I cook, it's, I just enjoy chopping onions, you know? Someone said to me, why don't you get a food processor? You're doing the same thing every night, chop, chop, chop. I don't want a food processor. I like chopping onions. I even like washing dishes, although some people say that's crazy, but I like it. Uh, uh, I mean, from what I gather from your talks, your books, and you know, uh, what you have been speaking, is it that yeah, I understand that after the shift, there is no robot speaking and there is no Ilango listening. It is just happening. Everything is happening by itself. Is that the bottom line? No, I hear that all the time. That's not really true. You, you exist for me as a, as a, as a separate person. I, I know, see, I don't know you well, but we have been carrying on for a couple of years now. I know, I know things about you. I know, I know, you know, you live in Indonesia, right? Am I right there? India, India. India, India. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. I, so I had that wrong, but you, you live in India. I know that about you. There's a cultural milieu that applies to you that doesn't apply to me, just as you're not an American, you know? Um, or a Mexican. I'm, I'm both now, apparently. Passports say that anyway. But I'm really an American. I was born and raised there. I have all those hidden little gems. <laughs> so I, I consider you a, a person, a human being. I'm not one of these spiritual teachers who say the person doesn't really exist. That's nonsense. Like, like, like Jim Newman, example. Yeah, Jim Newman and I had a really great conversation because unlike some people, I don't think that he's full of shit. I think he's describing an actual experience that he had, but I think he's using an, an unfortunate vocabulary that he inherited from um, Parsons. Tony Parsons. Yeah. Tony Parsons, yeah. And if he didn't use that vocabulary and spoke more just plain English, I think a lot of people would recognize that he actually is awake in that sense. So there is a, a, a difference between what you say and you know Jim Newman, Tony Parson group of spiritual teachers where they say there is no one speaking to no one, but you say it is Robert speaking to Yulango, but it is happening by itself. What, what I say is we don't know what anything is. So how can Tony Parson say, this doesn't exist, that doesn't exist, that never happened. How, where is he standing to, to, to be able to say that? I, I consider that I'm in, awake and, and I, I, I can't say things like that. 
I would be lying if I if I see that's when I when I was telling you I had this time as as the guru thing, I would say things like that, but they weren't mine. I said them because it's a lot of pressure when someone starts asking you questions, you know, you want an answer to give and so you draw it from somewhere. I came to the end of that. I came to the place where I realized I'm going to die. What the fuck? Might as well be honest and just tell it like it is. And then, and, and some people hate me for that. Not, maybe not hate. They, I get, I get some bad mail. <laughs> okay, Robert, you are different. Just to, again, you know, to clarify. So you accept Robert Salzman is there with a the body mind. You accept Ilango is there. You are an American. I am an Indian with yes. different cultural milieus. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference that you know the human population thinks about, and you are different? The thing is, you think we are all doing this automatically, like a software, cosmic software? Well, I'm just to be clear, I have this point of view, but I'm not alone in seeing things this way. There are other people on this planet. They may yes, be, yes. They may be unusual, but I'm not. I'm not like this one, the one, the one out of billions of people who has this point yeah. of view. And so, Jim Newman and. Tony Parsons, they have a, maybe have a different point of view. I'm not saying they're wrong. I, I'm just saying I can't speak that way. I can't tell you nothing, nothing ever happened. I would never say that. Plenty of things happened. Uh, you know, the World War, yeah, yeah. II, World War II happened. <laughs> My last birthday happened. People came here, you know, and we, we, we drank wine and laughed. Now, now, now there is a pandemic happening. Yes, that's right. And they're, that's right. And, and, they're, and instead of saying the way that the spiritual teachers like to say, oh, well, you know, God will take care of it. It's all love. No, there are people who are working on vaccines and getting the vaccines distributed and injecting them into arms and all that. I can have more respect for that kind of activity than I can some guy sitting on the throne with people kissing his feet. That, that to me, Richard, I'm clear on that. Another thing, uh, ultimately, do you accept that you, I, the planets, the sun, the star, the galaxies, everything, atoms, quarks, they are all from the same energy source. There is only one thing in the universe manifesting as the many. Do you accept that or you think it is a hypothesis? I think it's a hypothesis. I, I, no one is situated so as to know that. To take an extreme case, we could be a brain in a vat with some mad scientists giving us all these perceptions that we that we think refer to a world when there is no that scientist is living in a world but not the world that he makes us see you're, it, you're talking of a simulation right what I, what i'm saying is that people who pontificate about god love oneness one energy drives the whole thing they where are they standing so that they can see all that? I can't see that. I, don't, I can't see it. I can think it. Sure, someone can make an argument for oneness and I can follow their train of thought and say, yeah, you know, I could see how someone could, could uh, believe that. What is your take on consciousness and awareness? Consciousness. Do you believe in consciousness? Well, it's hard to hard to deny that. I mean, we are conscious. Uh, it's not that I believe in it. We're, obviously, we're conscious. I mean, if right. I do this, you hear it. That's, you're conscious. Richard, you, you, after Richard Hall told you to write a book and you transformed yourself from a human being into a sort of a guru and then you changed your mistakes, you became a writer. Me, as another human being who's still suffering, what would what do you, what I am not, I'm not even asking you as an advice. You've written two books and you're getting a lot of people uh, saying that things are helping. Uh, what would you sort of like us to take as the message from the book to change our lives or whatever? I'm not even asking for a solution. Just as a human being to another human being, you've written two books and after reading the books, what do you feel we should give, give up? You mean violence we should give up or uh, the attitude? What would be your sharing? I, I, I think if you want my advice, um, yeah. 
I think it's best to stop believing in metaphysics of any kind. Just your those that's made up. There's no knowledge in it. All these India has a long tradition. It does. Upanishads purport to explain reality. Although there is one verse where they say maybe maybe God doesn't even know. You know that you know about that verse in the Upanishads. There's I I can't I can't quote it, but who knows how this all got here? Nobody knows. Maybe God doesn't even know. So that's this one element of doubt that was put in the Upanishads. But other than that, it's a long text that purports to explain reality. I wouldn't say those books should be burned, but I think it's best to just read them skeptically and keep asking yourself, and you know that how? And how do you know that? See, and then there'll, there'll, there'll be various stories. God gave it, you know, this was given from the big guy or- Yeah, yeah. Yes, really? That sounds like a made up story to me. I think someone wrote that shit and said, I was in yeah. It's like Moses went to the mountain and got the seven, the 10 commandments. Really? God spoke to him. See, though, uh, to me, that's a, that's a, sounds made up. So what would be your advice, apart from the Upanishads and Vedas, what would be Robert Salzman? My, my advice is to stop thinking about spirituality and think about being a human and not, not, oh, but, not, and not making this into something better. It's oh, not okay, Robert, I got it. Uh, one, another thing, see, uh, people like to, uh, the Vedas, they talk about the universal power, the uh, human soul, the cosmic soul, the connection called as yoga, blah, blah. That is one theory. The next theory came with Tony Parsons who said, nobody is speaking to nobody and there is nothing to be done. But from you, I, I gather it is like there is a human being with a body mind. But the message is, understand that you are not doing it. You are not having a life. Life is having you. I mean, is that a message I can take, take home? Yeah, on that, on that on that point of view, you're not having a life. You are a life. This is life. These are these are these bodies are alive. There's not some little little guy inside the body that has a body and has a life. The whole thing is life. And I think you don't accept free will then. Accept which? Free will. Free will. Free will. Uh, if if you think there's free will, if you do, just create the Olongo that you wish you had and be done with it. What does Robert Salzman think? Does Robert think there is a free will? I think I wake up in the morning and the world is already here and I have to deal with it. So the answer is no. You know, I, I don't want to say yes or no because whatever I say, someone will be able to make a good argument for the for the opposite it's it's a foolish question unless you first under, go into what is will and what would it mean to have free will would uh, this will be my last answer to your questions because there's other people here but i know i know that i know that probably suppose, Thank you. suppose you I, I i think this is in one of my books pretty pretty sure it is Suppose I say, here's a vanilla ice cream cone or a chocolate one, which would you like? You have the free will to choose, am I right? Yeah. Most people would say that. I just decide, yes. I decide freely. There's no coercion. I decide yes. freely which one and I take it. Now you take the chocolate one. Okay. Now you come to me to discuss free will. And I say, well, Ilango, why did you choose the chocolate one? And you say, because I like chocolate and I don't like vanilla. And I say, oh, really? Well, when did you decide to like chocolate? You understand? You never did. Your likes and dislikes just come upon you like fate. Or you were trained by your family. Not a decision. I mean, you're given food when you're six months old. And that's the food you, it's Indian food for you. And for me, it's American food. And that's, yes. 
Okay. Pleasure to see you. I'm sure it won't be. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very good to see you, Ilango. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Good time. Yes.